Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Command Valley. My name is Griffin, and I'm here with Landon. Today on the podcast, we're going to be talking about the non-legendary rares and mythics in the Ikora Lair of Behemoth main standard set. If you enjoy this video, please give us a like, and if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe to the channel. It helps us out a lot. Also want to give a big shout out to our sponsor, GameGrid Lehigh. If you are in the Utah County area, please check them out. They have amazing staff. They have a wonderful selection of cards and also a huge selection of card accessories, sleeves, and lots of other games. We'll put a link in the description below to their website so you can go ahead and check them out. All right, like we mentioned in the beginning of the video, we are going to be going over the non-legendary mythics rares that we find playable in Commander. And a lot of the mythics and rares in the set are very playable in Commander. I found myself getting inspired by a lot of these cards, and a lot of these cards are going into a lot of my decks. And let's just get right into it. Everything that I said holds very true for the first card we're going to be talking about, which is Fiend Artisan, or Fiend Artisan, depending on how you want to pronounce it. It is a hybrid Golgari, hybrid Golgari creature nightmare that gets plus one, plus one for each creature card in your graveyard. It also has an activated ability that costs X in a hybrid Golgari. Tap it, sacrifice another creature, and then you search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost X or less, put it onto the battlefield and shuffle your library. And you can only activate this ability anytime that you would cast a sorcery. Immediately my mind goes to birthing pod or type like a Vanifar type effect or a Neoform type effect, but it's in green and black as opposed to green and blue. I think that this card is amazing in any, any deck that wants to be aristocrats and has maybe Maybe a blood artist that they're missing on the battlefield to finish out the game or maybe they're looking for or maybe you're looking for a big finisher that's going to create a lot of value for you for me personally this is probably going to be an automatic include in my Corvold deck which is a jund dragon a jund aristocrat strategy and this card is literally perfect for it the fact that i can sacrifice a token and depending on how much mana i pay i can find a much bigger creature to me is actually a lot more helpful than birthing pod i find that with birthing pod there are some awkward scenarios where let's say you've got an eight mana creature in your deck but you don't have a six mana creature in your deck it can be kind of hard to actually find a creature with enough cmc to satisfy birthing costs requirement to get that eight mana creature but fiend artisan the only thing that it really cares about is how much mana i dump into it in relation to the creature that i can tutor out so being able to turn tokens token creatures into avenger of zendikars or grave titans or other big scary creatures I love that. Next up, we've got Luca, Coppercoat Outcast, our first Planeswalker for this set. He has three red red for a five loyalty Planeswalker. His plus one, exile the top three cards of your library. Creature cards exile this way, gain. You may cast this card from exile as long as you control a Luca Planeswalker. For minus two, exile target creature you control, then reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal a creature card with higher converted mana cost. Put that card onto the battlefield and the rest on the bottom of your library in random order. And then finally, minus seven, each creature you control deals damage equal to its power to each opponent. So coming in with five loyalty for five mana, that's a pretty good rate. So let's go ahead and look at the abilities. The first one, it reminds me a lot of Vivian from War of the Spark that allows you to get creatures and you can put them in exile and you can cast them later. With Luca though, you have to have them out in order to cast those creatures. But honestly, I don't mind that because this is a very unique ability in red to be able to exile creatures and cast them. So even though you do have to control a Luca Planeswalker to cast them, it is his plus one and we don't normally see this in red. So I like that a lot. His minus two exiling the creature you control and then revealing till you grab another creature and cast it, but it has to have higher converted mana cost. That's actually really cool for a minus two. That means you can use it as soon as he comes out, which if there's anything Landon and I love, it's something that can do something the turn it comes out. So if you're playing a deck with a lot of high CMC creatures, if you're playing uh, in Theros Beyond Death Perforos, if you're playing Xenagos, if you're playing Ilharg the Raised Boar, any deck where you have a large amount of big creatures, this is going to be a useful tool for you to get those out quicker. So with the minus seven, uh, since he comes out with five loyalty, you can get it in two turns and that ability can win you the game. If you have enough creatures with high power, then you can just wipe out your opponents because it does say each opponent. So essentially a Chandra's Ignition for each of your creatures. So I, I really like Luca. He has a lot of flexibility. There's a lot of options on him and it goes really well in creature decks that don't normally have have this type of effect in red. So good job, Luca. Next up, we have Luminous Brood Moth. It is a two white white creature insect with flying, and it says, whenever a creature you control without flying dies, return it to the battlefield under its owner's control with a flying counter on it. Yeah. <laughs> this has a lot of combo potential. As you've probably already seen, if you followed any any accounts on any social media, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, that have that talk about spoilers or cover spoilers, the different combos have very much been explored for the Luminous Brood Moth. So basically what you do, 
there's an enchantment called Solemnity, costs two and a white. So, so what Solemnity does is it says players can't get counters and creatures can't be and counters can't be put on artifacts, creatures, enchantments, or lands. So essentially, with Luminous Broodmoth and Solemnity on the table and some sack outlet, be it Phyrexian Altar, Ashnod's Altar, Viserys Seer, any any sack outlet that goes infinite, you get infinite ETBs, infinite death triggers. Um, it's just another another combo piece in the aristocrats type sacrifice infinite combo so any deck that wants to win w via solemnity i would probably put it in zur because zur as a commander can actually tutor solemnity out onto the battlefield so it's like having half the combo in your command zone and then you just have to find one of the many ways of going infinite with a solemnity and i think that this would be awesome in so many decks that are playing white and playing creatures so just about all of them and this is definitely going into my afara deck because having my creatures die and my opponent's turn with this out is going to bring them back and trigger a faro so i can draw more cards overall great card probably should pick up a copy time is racing toward us till our opponents arrive okay next up we have narsa of the ancient he way he did the kick he did yeah no you did the kick oh sorry they, they won't know that but oh. i mean you did the narsa i too. did you know the because they do that in the movie too it's exactly that position too next up we have narsa of the ancient way she is back she is one blue red white for a four loyalty planeswalker so already four mana for a four loyalty planeswalker good rate Plus one, you gain two life. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, we can stop there. Next, <laughs> next card. Add blue, red, or white. Spend this mana only to cast a non-creature spell. Minus two, draw a card, then you may discard a card. When you discard a non-land card this way, Narsa of the Ancient Way deals damage equal to that card's converted mana cost to target creature or planeswalker. And then minus six, you get an emblem with whenever you cast a non-creature spell, this emblem deals two damage to any target. <laughs> So the first thing that we notice about Narset is that she's highly focused around spell slinging. Specifically, she has two loyalty abilities that care about non-creature spells. That means with if you're playing Narset in a Jeskai deck, you want to be playing a lot of spells, you want to play a lot of instants and sorceries, enchantments, even artifacts. That plus one that lets you fix and ramp, that's really cool, especially because you can use that again the turn it comes out. Minus two. The minus two isn't amazing, but it can give you some flexibility if you need to get rid of a creature, but you don't have the spell to do it. So you can just discard one of your high costed spells and just dome a creature or planeswalker. And then the minus six, dealing two damage from each of your non-creature spells, that may not seem like a lot, but that can definitely add up, especially if you're casting spells a lot on your turn. You're doing a lot of cantrips, you're casting a lot of wheels a lot of counter spells like this, that, that damage will add up really quickly, especially if you can do this multiple times. I wouldn't expect this to stick around long enough for you to get that minus six twice. Overall, this is a okay card in a spell slinging deck. I don't think that I would put this in a Jeskai deck. I don't think she really gives that much more to a deck than you could already have. The The benefit to Narset is that really what you're doing is trying to just get mana and ramping off of Narset. However, your opponents won't really see Narset as a threat and you might be able to get that minus six pretty quickly. So there is a benefit. We've talked a lot about Planeswalkers that although they might not be very powerful, using their abilities multiple times because people don't see them as a threat can end up as being a threat in the game. On to the last Planeswalker in the set, we have Vivian, Monster's Advocate. She costs three green green for a legendary Planeswalker Vivian. She has a static ability that says you may look at the top card of your library anytime and you may cast creature spells from the top of your library. Alrighty, that's really good. Extending your hand by one card. Her plus one says create a three three green beast creature token and put your choice of a vigilance, reach, or trample counter onto it. And then her minus two says when you cast your next creature spell this turn search your library for a creature card with lesser converted mana cost put it onto the battlefield then shuffle your library i feel like this is probably the most pushed of the three planeswalkers from this set um being able to tutor a creature into play although that creature will be smaller than the creature that you cast i feel like that is not something to trifle with um i don't know if it's gonna go into my corvold deck but i think it's super cool in a deck that wants to play a lot of creatures and a deck that is looking for some key creatures as part of an engine i think if you're playing a green deck and in that green deck you are playing creatures you will want a copy of vivian in there she can do something the turn she comes out five mana is a little bit expensive and if you know you cast her on curve you might not get in, get anything out of her but at least if you cast her on curve she can make a blocker she pluses herself up and if you're already playing a lot of creatures 
creatures or you have played a lot of creatures on the curve when you cast her she's probably going to make it around the table and you will at least get one tutor off of her and i think already that's amazing with how few budget tutors there are in commander this is a great card next up we've got Dronith magistrate which is one and a white for a one three human wizard your opponents can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hands white gets another control piece this it reminds me of being like the hush bringer of this set yeah. How many decks and strategies does this shut down? Uh, it shuts down any strategy that relies on the commander. Yep, you can't cast the commander. You can't cast things from the graveyard. You can't cast things from your the top of your deck. It shuts down Muldrotha. It shuts down my cast deck because I can't cast my instant sorceries from my graveyard. Um, the fact that this just stops commanders. I think this is probably one of the worst hate bear cards because the fact that it says your opponents can't cast spells from anywhere other than their hand, everybody's going to hate this as soon as that's, they see it. That's starting to be a theme that I think this has been going on since probably since war of the spark there has been some type of white hate bear in every standard set yeah we said we had to wizards. silence hushbringer this now um i'm probably missing some i don't know i think probably by the end of the year or maybe even next year you could build and i know that you already i know that you already can build a hate bear deck in commander there are enough of them you can definitely build a pretty oppressive hate bear deck i love control decks and this, this is more than control this, this is this like is heavy this is like control. stacks yeah yeah i i i do like it i do like it a lot this is almost a leveler against those type of strategies that just catch so much synergy more mm -hmm. than you the fact that this breaks symmetry meaning doesn't affect you like if you're playing a white deck that is controlly or a little bit slower it's probably a pretty good option or if you're in a meta where maybe one of your friends has a really obnoxious deck that wins really fast and their commander's half the combo like an urza deck or a thrasios deck or something like that or kess yeah i don't rely on kess i don't even cast it like 70 percent of the time <laughs> okay i think we can move on next up we have the first of the ultimatum cycle with eerie ultimatum for a meager price of white white black 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 green green you get a sorcery that says you win the game <laughs> Basically, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so it says, return any number of permanent cards with different names from your graveyard to the battlefield. No exiling itself afterwards. I will say that this is probably the most unclever of the ultimatums. I mean, it's... I mean, I don't know what it's, it's broken. I mean, it, it the fact that it, it says cards with different names from your graver to the battlefield makes me think that they were hoping that this would just be played in standard and that that would be somewhat of a downside because a lot of decks in constructed formats use a lot of cards with the same names. Um, I hope that they didn't just completely forget about commander when designing this card, but this seems like a pretty good finisher. It's like a living death, but only you get the benefits from it and it hits all permanents with different names. We're going to look at the other ultimatums in a second, but a lot of the ulti other ultimatums and a lot of cards that have this effect generally exile themselves afterwards that they after that they are cast because they you don't want to abuse them because it's very easy to abuse cards like this. And I don't know why they didn't do it for this card. I don't know if they thought, well, Abzan doesn't have that much recursion like her, but it does. are you kidding me? You just Eternal need- Eternal Witness, Eternal Nauseous Witness. Revival, <laughs> Regrowth. There are like eight different cards that say the same thing as regrowth. I don't know all of them, but green is the best color of getting cards back from your graveyard. However, I think that this card, you do it once and you don't really need to do it again. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like you, you return everything from your graveyard to the battlefield. Why would you want to, why would you need to cast this again? Right? Like I could see it. I think if you don't win like on that turn or the next turn, like you maybe built your deck wrong. That's true. I mean, I could see a play where you have something like a Phyrexian altar and eternal witness, and then you have a bunch of creatures. You sacrifice them all. You bring them to the graveyard with like a zeal port. Well, that's throat. already infinite right there with that, with Eerie Ultimatum, if you've got nothing. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. If you, well, I mean, you just use your creatures to pay the cost for Eerie Ultimatum, you cast it, you bring them yeah. all back, Eternal Witness trigger. There, there, there's probably a way of going infinite. Yeah. It, it's There are probably a lot of easier ways of doing it, but I think the reason why there isn't exile on this card is i think honestly because you just do it once you empty your whole graveyard and then like, what are you gonna do after what that? are you gonna do after that right it's like well that's uh that's probably a game guys <laughs> although i would love to have this i mean if you eerie ultimatum and somebody's got a cyclonic rift and you have to discard at the end of turn like i'm gonna want this still so yeah, yeah. this is an amazing card continuing <laughs> wizards fetish for green we have emergent ultimatum black black green green blue blue for a sorcery search your library for up to three monocolored cards with different names and exile them and a opponent chooses one of those cards shuffle that 
card into your library, you may cast the other cards without paying their mana cost and exile emergent ultimatum. There we go, we have the exile clause. So I've seen a lot of discussion on this on Twitter where people are trying to find a play where you can, no matter what they pick, you win. And I haven't seen one that's fully... I haven't seen one that wins you guaranteed on the spot. Win, yeah, yeah the, it's not guaranteed. The best that I've seen is having a deck with Jace, Wilder. Jace Wielder of Mysteries, Omniscience, and Enter, Enter the Infinite. Either way, you're either going to win or it's just going to be really bad and you're going to get an Omniscience. <laughs> So yeah, this is these emergent or these ultimatum cards are really really good. This one is is very commander though. Um, like th I was thinking about it, I play intuition in some of my decks, which is instant speed. You basically do the same thing as emergent ultimatum, except for there is no contingency on the color of the cards that you're finding with intuition. And instead of casting them, two go into your hand and one goes into your graveyard. And there are lots of like interesting intuition piles that will result in a win no matter what your opponents choose. But with emergent ultimatum, I think it's also super cool in the sense where you can leverage the political aspect of it where let's say there is one opponent that has a super problematic board and is threatening a win super quickly i mean if you're casting emergent ultimatum i mean you're probably doing it late game so maybe everybody has really scary boards but you can use it in a sense where you pick an opponent and that maybe is a little bit further behind or on level with you with another opponent being super far ahead and hopefully you could get one spell that deals with the opponent and maybe one spell that helps you or maybe helps that opponent i think that's pretty interesting that's very commander continuing on with the ultimatums we have have Genesis Ultimatum that costs green, green, blue, 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 red, red. We almost have an entire stoplight here. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting there. We're just We're missing close. yellow. <laughs> when are they going to make a yellow color symbol? Okay. And for that much mana, seven to be exact, you get a sorcery that says, look at the top five cards of your library. Put any number of permanent cards from among them onto the battlefield and the rest into your hand. Exile Genesis Ultimatum. At worst, bottom, bottom, bottom floor, you paid seven mana and you drew five cards. At best, you probably won the game. I think that's, uh, that's you probably, th yeah. Why? You're putting five permanents into play. If you built your deck, like, to wo work off of that, you're probably winning the game. I think, think about an ML, what? Like, it's, I mean, yeah, I mean, an Maelstrom Wanderer deck, that's really good, but they don't cascade cast. No, no, I'm think. sorry, I guess, like, five, five permanents. Mm -hmm. You don't think that's good? No, no, it's really good. I just don't think it's, like, immediate win. I think that's, like, well, gonna well, help you win. Well, yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, you're winning the game. Like, you haven't won the game, but you're winning. Right. Putting five permanents into play. It definitely like, puts out of you nowhere. in the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spot. Um... Well, like, I used to, like, when I first read this card, I thought that the cards that you don't get just go to the bottom of your library. No, they go into your hand. So, like, I think that if this were any color that didn't have green, like, if this were Grixis or something, it wouldn't be that good. But since you're in green, like, you can ramp into it. I think that's pretty good. I would put Genesis Ultimatum in any deck that is playing big mana permanence. If you're playing, I mean, it, it'd be cool in a Riku deck if you could copy it, um, if you have that much mana. Or in an Animar deck that's playing lots of big creatures because you're banking on Animar to reduce those costs. So, like, it'd be cool in a Maelstrom wander deck because you could theoretically cascade into this and casting this for free that's really good but yep putting five permanents into play probably won't absolutely win you the game but it will really 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 increase your chances i think especially in a team or big spell deck next up we have the just guy and probably the prettiest art of all the ultimatums it's inspired ultimatum blue blue or a red 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 white white for a sorcery target player gains five life inspired ultimatum deals five damage to any target and you draw five cards eh? <laughs> I don't think this one was necessarily built for commander. That effect against one opponent is super good. That effect against three opponents is just not enough for, for seven mana. There's a lot of other things I'd rather have in a team or deck at seven mana than Inspired Ultimatum. Yeah. Again, it doesn't exile itself. There's a chance of recurring it. If you copy it, play it from your graveyard. There's some cool things that you can do with this. I just, I, I really don't think that this was built for commander. And I think there's better cards that you could put into your decks, uh, your Jeskai decks to have a bigger effect on the board. I think your deck has to really want it. Um, and you have to already be in the market for slinging spells and copying spells. I think seven mana for this ability one time. I don't know, five cards, five cards. That's a lot of cards. Um, and if you're looking for card draw in your deck, seven mana might be a lot for it, but card draw. And to close out the ultimatum cycle, we have ruinous ultimatum for red red white 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 black black we get a sorcery that says destroy all non-land permanents your opponents control your opponents control all non-land permanents um 
Well, that's pretty good. It's, 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 yeah. I mean, it's, it's good. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. People ha- are comparing it to, uh, Cyclonic Rift. I think it's more like in Garrick's Wake. This destroys all non land permanents. And Cyclonic Rift just bounces them back to their hands, but this destroys all non land permanents for seven mana. I don't know. I, you, you, every Mardu deck wants this. Yeah. It's high costed, but it's an amazing effect for that cost. So it's worth it. It's worth it to pay seven mana to destroy all non land permits your opponent's control. What if you die before you get to seven mana consistently meta? If you die consistently before you get seven mana in your meta, I I wouldn't play this card. I mean, like, that's my opinion. Because that's something you have to think about with big mana spells is, is how many times does this big seven mana spell sit in my hand and not do anything? I think Ruinous Ultimatum will always do something. It's always going to blow up you know things your opponents probably play non-land cards i think in commander right that's you play non-land cards sometimes cool. maybe like a signet or two or like a locket well yeah blowing up your opponent's lockets it's like pretty good yeah it's i mean good rate. imagine if you hit like an azorius locket with this your opponents will be devastated next up we've got the first of the enchantment cycle for the three colors we've got death's oasis it costs a white, a black, and a green, and it says, whenever a non-token creature you control dies, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard, then return a creature card with lesser converted mana cost than the creature that died from your graveyard to your hand. Also has an activated ability that says pay one and sacrifice death's oasis. You gain life equal to the greatest converted mana cost among creatures you control. This card reminds me of Scrap Trawler, but for creatures. Scrap Trawler lets you get artifacts back from your graveyard to your hand that have that deal with converted mana costs, death oasis, like to get creatures back. I don't know why you would ever want to sacrifice this for life. I guess maybe if your back is really up against the wall and you're about to lose, that might be nice. But this value, the value engine, actually, I think this is a pretty good value piece. If you're in an Abzan deck that a lot of Abzan decks like Carador or the new Cathriel want to play a lot of creatures, a lot of a lot of strategies in Abzan use the graveyard. It's a it's a good graveyard synergistic strategy color combination. I just think this is a good engine piece. I mean, you get creatures back that died, especially if you have ways of filling your graveyard really easily cool pretty uh pretty good the fact that every time a non-token creature dies you're recurring something and you mill too and you mill too that's really powerful especially in abzan next up we have the next enchantment the teamer enchantment song of creation one green blue red for an enchantment you may play an additional line on each of your turns whenever you cast a spell draw two cards hot diggity dog and at the beginning of your end step discard your hand that's a downside but man can you abuse this card the fact that you can cast or you can play your lands that you're drawing consistently and whenever you cast a spell you're drawing two cards you can siphon so much during and it's anytime you cast a spell it's not just during your turn so you can cast jump start spells. yep flashback um retrace your one mana brainstorm suddenly becomes draw five put two back it's really good so if you're playing a lot of spells, if you're playing a lot of jumpstart, flashback, a lot of stuff back from your graveyard, Retrace. if you can draw cards from your creatures that you have on the battlefield as another Yeah, if you have like an Arc- Arcanist the Omnipotent, like a humble defector, things that can draw you cards, Jace's Ar- Archivist, things that can draw you cards on the battlefield, then this is just honestly it's just amazing even if you don't have that. If you have the mana to play your spells, let's say you have 10 mana, you can siphon through a lot of cards and at the end of your turn you're going to have like 12, 15 cards in your hand still next up we have whirlwind of thought it costs one blue red white for an enchantment that says whenever you cast a non-creature spell draw a card i can't see any downside to this card i i was looking over the jeskai commanders all of the jeskai commanders want you to be casting non-creature spells like i i honestly i I can't think of a reason why you just wouldn't want to play this card if you're in jeskai it doesn't have the downside of song of creation where you have to discard your hand it doesn't draw you quite as many cards but i would take not having to discard my hand at the cost of only drawing one less card and not being able to put a land or play an extra land than having to discard my hand in a turn. So next up we have the Sultai enchantment Titan's Nest for one black, green, blue. We have an enchantment. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may look at the top card of your library. You may put that card into your graveyard and then exile a card from your graveyard. Add colorless. Spend this mana only to cast a colored spell without an X in its mana cost. I've also seen a lot of talk about this uh, over Twitter and about the different ways that you can abuse this card. The fact that you can use this the turn that it comes out, you don't have to use anything or it doesn't cost anything to, to siphon your graveyard for mana. Already that's a powerful effect. Having it on an enchantment that doesn't say you have to exile itself at the end of the turn, 
That's really, really good. You're in Saltai, so you're probably doing some stuff with your graveyard anyway. If you've dumped 40 cards into your graveyard, then all of the spells, all the spells in your hand could essentially just be the mana pips that they have in them. If you have a spell that's seven green green, it could just be green green. That is really, really strong, and I wouldn't underestimate this card at all. And I'm very scared to see it on the battlefield. The downside is you can't cast X spells, so obviously you can't use like the Villainous Wealth, Pull From Tomorrow's, Torment of Hellfire, Stanguid Ain't. But I can see I can see the reasoning why then I think it would be a little bit too good. But even without, the, I mean, even with that clause, you can do some nuts things on your turn. So Offspring's Revenge is a enchantment that costs two red, white, black. And it says at the beginning of combat on your turn, exile target red, white, or black creature card from your graveyard. Create a token that's a copy of that card, except it's a 1-1 one, one, and it gains haste until your next turn. I like this enchantment because you can profit off of it the turn that it comes out. If you cast it in your pre-combat main phase, which you'd probably want to do. I would absolutely love reanimating any of the Praetors or demons with powerful activated abilities or just normal powerful abilities like Villas, Broker of Blood, or Razaketh. Basically any big mana creatures with powerful activated abilities or static abilities are really awesome because reanimating big creatures doesn't really mean anything with this because it turns it into a 1-1, but it does gain haste and you don't have to sacrifice it at the end of the turn. It stays around, it stays on the table. Um, I think it opens up some potential for some type of graveyard shenanigans in Mardu that we haven't really seen before, haven't really Really, I haven't really seen a deck like that. So I think it's an enchantment that has a lot of potential. Next up, we have the Mythos Cycle, which are spells that have something to do with one of the Apexes. So the first one that we're going to be talking about is Mythos of Brokos. It costs two green green for a sorcery that says return up to two permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand. And if you spent blue or black to cast a spell, you can search your library for a card, put that card into your graveyard, then shuffle your library. So if you paid a blue, black, green, green to cast this spell, it's like a four mana a tutor which is pretty cool i guess like we were saying earlier green is probably the best color at getting things back from the graveyard you can return two permanent cards from your graveyard to your hand for four mana that's essentially drawing two cards and being able to search a library for any card putting it into your hand that's pretty good next up we have mythos of a luna for two blue blue a sorcery, create a token that's a copy of target permanent. If red green was spent to cast a spell and said create a token that's a copy of that permanent, except the token has when this permanent enters the battlefield, if it's a creature, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. This is a really good card already. Being able to make a copy of a permanent, that means you can get lands, enchantments, artifacts, creatures, planeswalkers, artifact creatures. I think I would rarely use the red green to have it fight another creature. I don't think I'd normally want to do that, but hey, it's an extra it's an extra benefit to using this spell. So yeah, if, it, if you're in a tight pinch, if you need to get rid of a creature, or maybe you just want to, you have the mana for it, then might as well go for it. But I think the real power of this is the fact that it can make a copy of any permanent. One thing to note, if you were curious, Mythos of Luna and Mythos of Brokos can only be played in a uh, Sultai or Teamer deck, respectively. Mythos of Luna can only be played in a teamer deck because of the red and green pips in the uh, text box and same with Brokos only being able to be played in a Sultai deck because of the blue and black pips. Same is true for the rest of the Mythos as well. Because they have that in the text box you can't play it in a deck without those colors. Next up we have Mythos of Nithroi. For two and a black, for an instant, destroy target non-land permanent if it's a creature, or if green and white was spent to cast this spell. I know that the wording is a little confusing, but basically, if you spend green, black, white, instead of two and a black, you can destroy any non-land permanent. If you just spend the two and a black, you can only kill a creature. It's a great card. Yep. Instant speed. <laughs> Goes in Abzan. Definitely does. Next, so, next up, we've got Mythos of Snap Dax, which is going to be our Mardu one. It's two white, white for a sorcery. Each player chooses an artifact, a creature, an enchantment, and a planeswalker from among the non land permanents they control, then sacrifices the rest. If black red was spent to cast a spell, you choose the permanents for each player instead. It, I, I think this card is definitely very situational. You would want to play this in a deck if you can assure that you're getting the most benefit off of this. Because it is a very strong card, but if you're in a deck that's playing a lot of creatures and you have to sacrifice all of them, or if you're playing a lot of artifacts, you want to make sure that this, this helps you out in the best way possible. It's a shame that it doesn't say each opponent, but that would probably be just way too good. But yeah, I, would, I generally would not play this in a deck where you are going to try to have a big board state, whether it's a creature board state, artifact board state, you got planeswalkers. I would use this as a sort of board wipe in a Mordu deck that plans to stay low and not have too much of a board and is trying to win a different way, whether it's by a combo, whether it's by a 
another alternate win condition, one where you don't have to set up a board in order to win. And the last mythos we have, we have Mythos of Hi. Vajrak. It's a sorcery that costs two red red, and it deals five damage divided as you choose among any number of target creatures and or planeswalkers. If white and blue was spent to cast the spell until your next turn, those permanents can't attack or block and their activated abilities can't be activated. I think that this is probably absolutely brutal in a standard format that is one-on-one, -on -one, being able to kind of put to sleep your opponent's creatures and maybe even kill some of them or shut down some of their planeswalkers. That's pretty cool, but I don't think that this gives you enough value to be worth it in Commander. Moving on, we just have another rare enchantment. It's Shark Typhoon for five and a blue. We have an enchantment. Whenever you cast a non-creature spell, create an XX blue shark creature token with flying, where X is that spell's converted mana cost. You can also cycle it for one generic blue and X. Whenever you cycle Shark Typhoon, create an XX blue shark creature token with flying. So this is, it has a lot of metallurgic summoning vibes on it. It has a lot of the, the young PZ vibes. Murmuring Mystic, anything that creates tokens off of casting instants and sorceries. This is non-creature spell though, so it has a lot more flexibility. I would not underestimate the fact that these tokens have flying. If you're playing a spell slinger deck, even though this is six mana, I think it's definitely worth it. If you can slap this down and start like casting spells like crazy, I think this is honestly super good. It, if I think it goes really well in Akeem. I think it goes really well in because. Kaikar. Any blue deck where you're casting a lot of spells, especially if you have ways to abuse these tokens, I think this is going to be a good slot in that deck. Next up, we have Unpredictable Cyclone. It's an enchantment that costs three red red, and it says a lot of words. If a cycling ability of another non-land card would cause you to draw a card, instead, exile cards from the top of your library until you exile a card that shares a card type with the cycled card. You may cast that card without paying its mana cost. Then, put the exiled cards that weren't cast this way on the bottom of your library in a random order, and it has cycling too. So as the name suggests, your results may vary depending on how you've built your deck. This reminds me a lot of Sunbird's Invocation, where it's kind of a, you're rolling the dice every single time you cast a spell, you really don't know what it is you're gonna get but maybe if you built your deck in such a way where you've only got two creatures in the deck with cycling and all the other cards in your deck with cycling are instants and sorceries if you got that means if you cycle the one creature you're gonna find the other creature and put it into play or vice versa if all the cards in your deck with cycling are creatures besides two instants and sorceries they're probably some type of like weird combo line that you could do to win the game but i really like these types of cards these enchantments like this like unpredictable cyclone sunbirds invocation swarm intelligence thousand year storm these cards become pet cards to me and i try to break them or do some really weird things with them i i really love that type of effect it's also very red it's very impulse it's a very impulsive form of card draw that's that's very red you know sometimes red sacrifices flexible card draw or, or flexible interaction in their hand for cards off the top of the library where they just you get the, the card right then and there you don't get to hold it in your hand and that's that's very red but that's card advantage for red so thank you guys so much for listening to our very lengthy and wordy descriptions on a lot of these cards we were just remarking before the video started that seems like this set in particular had a lot of words on a lot of the cards a lot more than normal but we really enjoyed evaluating these cards and looking at them through the lens of commander hope you guys enjoyed it hope you guys are looking forward to our future videos where we talk about where we do our deck techs and our future gameplay videos if you don't want to miss out on those please make sure you subscribe it's a free easy way to support the channel and we really appreciate your guys' support and with that we'll say to you guys have a good week